I saw that most of you have already completed the homework. This is good. Um, if you haven't, uh, you need to do it. <laughs> uh, not only is homework 15% of your grade, but it really is where you, you learn to use these ideas. So. <coughs> um, so today we're going to talk about momentum and change in momentum. We started talking about that uh, last week. And, uh, oh, one other announcement before I forget. There will be a quiz on Thursday sometime during It takes about 10 minutes. Um, it'll be involving the stuff you've been working with. Uh, before we get started on momentum, last time somebody mentioned acceleration, uh, which is a term you may well have heard, especially if you've taken a previous physics class. Um, what is acceleration and is it important? Well, acceleration is defined as the rate of change of velocity. <coughs> and so that's going to be a vector dvx dt dvy dt dvz dt. <coughs> and uh, we're actually not going to be usually very interested in acceleration because <coughs> it turns out we saw from our thought experiment last time by catching a bowling ball and catching a tennis ball and then catching a bowling ball traveling with the same velocity the interaction required to change the more massive objects mo did stop the more massive object was a lot bigger so mass really matters so the the fundamental quantity that we're going to be working with here is momentum um, and so eventually we'll be interested in the rate of change of momentum now at at low speeds when this factor gamma is nearly one that's approximately equal to 
mass times acceleration. But we're going we're gonna to be very general. We're going to work with momentum, and we will do some things with particles traveling at really high speeds just to see what that's like. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> so, so, so this is a quantity that won't usually be very important to us. <coughs> Now, momentum, we decided last time, which for reasons that I don't, almost nobody knows, I think, is, has the symbol P as a vector, and it's equal to <coughs> the product of mass times velocity, and then this interesting factor gamma, and I just want to explore this factor gamma with you a little bit. Most of the time, we're going to be working with things that are not traveling near the speed of light. <coughs> but sometimes they will be. And gamma gets to be important when things are traveling near the speed of light. <coughs> now, one, one number you should know <coughs> is the speed of light. It has the, it's given the symbol lowercase c and it's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. <coughs> and it's basically a universal speed limit. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And the only thing that can go at the speed of light seems to be light. And we'll see why as we think about, about gamma here. Now, why should you know it? Well, for one thing, if you work a problem and you get a speed that's greater than 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, you should worry. <laughs> so physicists are offended when they see an answer on a paper that says the speed is 3 times 10 to the 10th meters per second. So, so keep this in mind. <coughs> so what is this gamma thing? Gamma is <coughs> this interesting factor, 1 over the square root of 1 minus the ratio of the speed of the object to squared. So we can see that if the object is at rest, its speed is 0, where I'm using v to mean the magnitude of the velocity here, the speed. This is 0, 1 minus 0 is 0, the square root of 1 is 1, gamma is 1. Now the question is, how fast do you have to get going before this, this really actually matters? So I wanna, what I want to do here is calculate gamma for some different speeds. Um, so let's... do it an easy way. Uh, we'll calculate gamma. We'll call this program gamma. And what we'll do here is we'll say we'll have a variable n and its value is 0 and we'll say the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th. <coughs> Okay, and we'll start with a v of zero. Actually, we don't need to do that. And we'll, we'll just loop through making n. We're going to use n as our exponent and make, make n bigger and bigger. So we're going to have 3 times 10 to the 0, 3 times 10 to the 1, 3 times 10 to the 2, 3 times, okay, and we're just going to count. So while n is less than 9, uh, we're going to set v to 3 times 10 to the nth. <coughs> so you may remember from your welcome to vPython tutorial that to, s to raise something to a power in Python is two stars, not a caret. <coughs> That's one way in which it differs from your calculator. <coughs> and then we'll say gamma is... 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus minus v over c squared 
and we'll print v that's a text string so it'll just show a v and then we'll print v over c so what fraction of the speed of light are we going and then we'll print gamma and then we better add one to n so that's just a simple little loop that starts out with <coughs> We're just counting through n from 0 to, to 8. And we're calculating gamma for 3 times 10 to the nth, and then we're going we're gonna to print the results. So let's run it. OK, and I'm going to make it a, I want to do there. <coughs> So when, when the speed is 3 meters per second, gamma is just 1. So when the speed is 30 meters per second, gamma still comes out to 1. When it's 300 meters per second and 3,000 meters per second and 30,000 and... Okay, we have to get up to 3 times 10 to the 6th meters per second before in our calculations gamma starts showing up as being not one and we might have to start worrying about its value um, <clears throat> now that's not out of the question and that it, it's easy to get little particles like electrons moving that fast um, we have some equipment here that where we can do that um, <clears throat> and three times ten to the seventh meters per second three times ten to the eighth meters per second okay we seem to be dividing by zero here because if that's 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, and that's infinity. And so that's not quite a, a good enough resolution. So let's, let's, let's add something to our program here. <coughs> let's say that we're, gonna count, we're just going to use the ratio of, of <coughs> v over c. So we're going to start with a ratio of v over c of 0.9. And since I can't use a slash in a variable name, I'll... And then I'll say, while V over C is less than 0 0.99999, <coughs> we'll calculate gamma here. Um, we better use the right variable name, though. We're calling it V over C here. <coughs> And we'll print uh, V over C and gamma. And we'll add So we'll add 0 0.001 to V over C. So we're going to go from 0 0.9 to 0 0.999, okay, speed of light. So if we run this program, our results look a little bit different. So back here, uh, when, when we had V over C was 0.901, gamma's already... 2.3. Okay, so our approximation of MV for momentum is not very good. So it's, and when we get up to 0.999, now the factor is a factor of 22, so we would be off by a factor of 22 in calculating the momentum of a fast moving particle in an accelerator uh, if, we, if we didn't actually take into account this, this value of gamma. <coughs> Um, and we can, in accelerators like the big one at, at CERN in Switzerland, we can get particles moving faster than that. So when people are doing research there, they really have to take into account. This factor, this was predicted by Albert Einstein, but it's been verified by lots of experiments where we get particles moving fast enough that we can see that the force required to change their momentum is more than, than it would be if this wasn't right. So. <coughs> So we're going to be usually making the approximation 
that momentum <coughs> is approximately mass times velocity as long as the speed is a lot less than the speed of light. And you can see you have to get up to a significant fraction of the speed of light before it, that starts to be incorrect. <coughs> now, you might not be used to making approximations in physics. You might think physics is exact. But in fact, we make approximations all the time. In fact, some numbers in physics that you have, may have worked with in a previous physics class, like the magnitude of the Earth's gravitational field near the Earth, 9.8, that's an approximation. That's not an exact number. And in fact, it varies depending on the local density of the Earth. And geologists go around measuring this number, measuring the Earth's gravitational field in order to find deposits of minerals or oil or whatever. So we're working with approximate numbers all the time. So it's not illegal. <laughs> we're okay. <coughs> Since we're going to be working with momentum a lot, it's worth talking about how to use momentum to update position. Ah, before we do that, let's actually answer a question. Um, okay, so think about the definition of momentum. And think, let's think about directions. What has to be true about the direction an, of an object's momentum and the direction of its velocity? So that's three? Three. Why do, they, why do we think it has to be the same? Mass, mass times velocity, and can mass ever be negative? No. no. So it's a scalar. We're multiplying by a scalar. It can change the, make the magnitude of that vector bigger. But if, as long as it's positive, it can't change the direction. Good. <coughs> All right. So for which protons <coughs> is it reasonable to use the approximation gamma is approximately one. The first one's traveling 290 meters per second. The second is traveling 2.9 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, which is reasonably fast. The third is 2.9 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Okay, think about it for a second. Check with your neighbor. So what do you think? <coughs> Fingers. One, two, three, four. <coughs> okay, I'm seeing ones and twos. So everybody says can't do it for three, right? <coughs> for two, well, we saw that when things were going 10 to the sixth meters per second, <coughs> gamma might have been starting to change in, a, in about the fourth or fifth decimal place. And usually we're, we're often doing calculations to at most three significant figures. So much of the time it would be fine to just ac approximate gamma as one in case B. We certainly can't do it in case C. We'd actually have to calculate. <coughs> okay. <coughs> So let's talk about using momentum to update position. Um, there's not that much to it. At, at low speeds. Because at low speeds, momentum is approximately mv. 
So V is going to be approximately momentum divided by mass. And now we're back to using the position update equation, right? We can just plug this into our final is our initial plus, we can even write it this way, momentum over mass <coughs> times delta T. So there's not a lot to it. So let's just do this. Um, let's say we have a 70 kilogram hockey player <coughs> who's at location, uh, what is it, 203 meters. <coughs> And with a momentum of, let me get this right, negative 210, 070. <coughs> negative 210, 0, 070. What are the units of momentum going to be? Kilogram meters per second, right? Okay. <coughs> So where will he be if his momentum stays constant? Where will he be two seconds later? So think about it for a sec. So what do we do? <coughs> okay, so we have our final is his initial position to zero three meters plus <coughs> negative two ten zero seventy kilogram meters per second divided by seventy kilograms <coughs> times two seconds. So this comes out to what? Negative three zero one meters per second times two seconds. And so we get uh, negative one, zero, four meters, one. Oh, that's times two. So we have to multiply by two. So two times three is negative six. Negative six plus two is negative four, zero, we have two plus three. Is that right? Okay, so not that much to it. <coughs> Okay, so we have a rock, mass 5.5 kilograms, traveling through outer space with a constant momentum of 006 kilogram meters per second. How far from its current location will it be in 10 seconds? Take one minute to Work on this, talk to your neighbor.
You ready? You have a question? Well, it doesn't tell you where it started, did it? It just said how far away where it is now. So, what are we actually calculating here? We're calculating a distance, and how do we get that out of this equation? So, so we rearrange this equation to get our final minus our initial is momentum over mass times delta t. And then that's going to give us a vector, right? We asked for a distance, so how do we convert a vector into a distance? A magnitude, right? So we have the magnitude of this should equal the magnitude of that. <coughs> so what's the answer? <coughs> Fingers. <coughs> Okay, mostly four. This is good. The answer is four. <coughs> because uh, zero, zero, six kilogram meters per second divided by zero point five kilograms. <coughs> zero, zero, twelve. <laughs> meters per second and after 12 seconds we've got so the displacement is going to be this vector and you should be able to get them because 120 squared plus 0 squared plus 0 squared, take the square root of that, it's 120, right? So any vector that's got a single component, it should be really easy to just get its magnitude by inspection. <coughs> Questions? <coughs> now what we're really interested in is changes in momentum. <coughs> So let's just remind ourselves, <coughs> if you're driving a car that weighs a thousand kilograms and you're going at 20 meters per second in the plus x direction, and then you make a 180 degree turn, so now you're going in the minus x direction, still at 20 meters per second. It's asking for the magnitude of the change of momentum of the car. <coughs> You guys are really much too quiet. <laughs> Talk to your neighbor. And we've got one dimensional motion, so magnitudes are easy. <coughs> you ready? What's your answer? <coughs> Okay, I'm seeing some people who are not committed. <laughs> Come on, if you don't know, guess. <coughs> uh, 
Okay. We were divided between 3 and 1. <coughs> so, order of operations actually matters here. So, what's the initial momentum of the car? So, it's going to be in the plus x direction, so it's going to be 20 times a thousand. 20 times a thousand zero zero kilogram meters per second. <coughs> so that's 2 times 10 to the fourth zero zero kilogram meters per second. <coughs> What's the final momentum? Okay, negative 2 times 10 to the 4, 0, 0 kilogram meters per second. <coughs> What's delta P, P final minus P initial? <coughs> Yeah, it's negative 40,000 zero, zero kilogram meters per second. So what's the magnitude of this quantity? So four times 10 to the fourth kilogram meters per second, right? Now, so first we had to find the change in momentum, delta P, and then we had to take the magnitude. What if we'd written it the other way? What if we'd said <coughs> the change in the magnitude of the momentum? That would be zero, wouldn't it? Because the magnitude of the momentum didn't change, but its direction did. <coughs> So, vectors are your friend. <coughs> okay, questions about this? <coughs> All right, so what we want to do is our goal here, we're now getting to the most important idea in this whole course, actually. It's our first fundamental principle. It's the momentum principle. And what it does is relate changes in the motion of an object to interactions with the surroundings of the object. And we want to do this quantitatively. We saw Newton's first law which said that an object continues to move at constant speed in a straight line except to the extent it interacts with objects in its surroundings. Now we want to make that quantitative so we can make predictions, we can send rockets to the moon, we can do cool stuff. And so we have to do two things. The, we've, we've quantified the thing that's changed by interactions, that's momentum. So momentum <coughs> This is what changes. And now we need to quantify interactions with the surroundings. <coughs> now here we're, we're starting to be careful about definitions of system and surroundings. The system is the object or objects uh, that we're interested in and the surroundings is everything else <coughs> and that may seem very simple but it occasionally sort of reaches out to bite you when you're not careful to choose one thing as the system and then everything else in the surroundings. So that's something we're going we're gonna to be talking about. Um, 
there, there are two ways. Uh, so there are two ways things can interact with the surroundings. There can be interactions at a dis. They're all, but they're, these objects always. Your system is always interacting with an object in the surroundings, and we're going to be very careful about that because it it helps us not. Uh, double count at times would we so uh, there are interactions at a distance so for example <coughs> what object is this ball interacting with at a distance the earth okay so the gravitational force that two massive objects exert on each other is an interaction at a distance it doesn't need to be touching the earth to interact with it we can see that by dropping it. <laughs> Graceful. Um, and the other way things can interact is by touching. So if something's in contact with something, it's definitely interacting with it. Now typically this is actually usually really electric forces. So electric forces are another force that acts at a distance. Proton and electron are attracted to each other and we'll talk a lot about that next semester. Um, but it's the electrons in your fingers and the electrons in the surface of the ball that are interacting with each other here. But for right now, there's so many of them that it's hard to resolve, so we'll just talk about it as a contact force for the moment. And there aren't any other kinds. So if my hand is not touching that ball, then my hand is not interacting with the ball. And we'll see how this works out in a little bit. Now the way we quantify uh, interactions is by the concept of force. And you've heard of force. And it pretty much is what you think it is. Uh, pushing, pulling. Uh, force, how do we measure forces? Well, one way to calibrate it is to stretch a spring to see, because springs are very nice if you exert a particular force, it stretches this far. If you exert twice the force, it stretches that far. So springs are just a nice measure of, of force. The units of force are Newtons, named after our friend Isaac Newton. And do you think force is a vector or a scalar? It's going to be a vector, isn't it? Because it has a direction. It has a magnitude and a direction. So force is a vector. So how does this work? Well... The relationship between force and change of momentum of a system is called the momentum principle. <coughs> and we call it a fundamental principle because it applies to everything in the universe as far as we know. So the momentum principle applies to basketballs and baseballs. It applies to protons and electrons. It applies to galaxies and clusters of galaxies. There's nothing too big or too small to be subject to this. And what it tells us, one way of talking about what it tells us is that if what we want to do is predict the momentum of our system sometime in short time in the future, we have to think about two things. <coughs> it depends on the system's momentum now, and it also depends on 
the net force acting on it. That's the sum of the forces exerted by all sorts of objects in the surroundings and the time over which it's applied. So these, you have to consider these two things. This quantity here, force times time, is called impulse. And this is a, a pretty simple relationship. When we get into trouble with it is if we forget one of these things. So we have a checklist of two things to think about every time we think about predicting the motion of, of some object. And the equation we use to predict the momentum of a system sometime in the future is can be written in the same form that we wrote the position update equation. So we can see P final, or P, I like to say P a little time in the future, is equal to the momentum now, or P initial, plus the net force acting on this system times the time over which it acts. <laughs> Um, so let's see how this plays out in a somewhat interesting situation. Um, because this is an interesting thing that we can use to where is this? There we go. To predict um, changes in momentum, whether our forces are constant or not, which makes it a pretty interesting and powerful kind of thing. So here's a model of the Earth going around the sun. So the yellow dot is the sun, the green dot is the Earth. <coughs> and what we can do is, if we can calculate the force act, the net force acting on the Earth, and we can calculate the change in momentum of the Earth, <coughs> so we can rewrite this as P future minus P now <coughs> is F net delta T, so that's the a change in momentum. So that's our change in momentum. We can add it to the old momentum and get a new momentum. And then we can get the velocity from the momentum. We just did that. So we can use that to update the position and then we can... It's a pretty simple algorithm. We just get... <coughs> calculate the net force calculate the new momentum, use this to calculate new position, and then probably the forces change so we do it again. So it's that just that kind of iterative calculation, a simple loop. So let's see what it looks like. So here is the momentum of our Earth right now, that's the blue arrow, and, and why doesn't this work? <coughs> there we go. Okay, so we calculate the gravitational force, we're going to learn to do that in chapter 3, and we're going to say let's let our time interval be a month. So what we're going to say is this force is going to be not changed for a month. So we're going to apply in our model this force to our planet for a month and see what its momentum will be at the end of that. And so that's the change in momentum there. That's, and so we add the current momentum to F net delta T 
and we get the new momentum and now we use that to get the velocity so we let the planet move in the direction of that velocity and it moves for a month and now we say okay now we better recalculate the force so now we get a new force and a new change in new impulse and so we have a new momentum and now we get a new velocity and we calculate it we let it move again and then we do it again this is why computers are nice because this is really tedious to do by hand although that's what Isaac Newton actually did um, so we get the new force a new impulse new momentum let the planet move new force new impulse new momentum and we're getting something that looks like an orbit right now it doesn't look like a great orbit does it why do you think it's not very good yeah so what we're doing is we're assuming that the force acting on the the planet is constant for a month but it moves a lot in a month and the direction and magnitude of the force can change in a month so let's change it to say we're going to take a time interval of a day instead we're going to recalculate the force every day and then instead of clicking I'm just going to let this program run you can see the force is changing it's always pointing from the earth the earth is always being attracted to the sun and now we get something that looks like the orbit we kind of expect and all we did was exactly the same algorithm we just changed delta t to be a smaller value so that instead of a polygon that's right we get a circle although this circle is made up of really teeny straight line segments they're so close together you can't actually see them but our, our model is still calculating a one day time interval if we wanted to be even more accurate we could take an hour <coughs> what, hap what would happen if we took a really big time interval like three months So here's our force, here's our impulse. Now it's, it's a big impulse because it's delta T is big, right? So the new momentum's like that, the new velocity's like that. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and now you can't even see. We just calculated it. It's that little red arrow there. It's so far away that the force is really small. And so in the next time interval, it's gone. <laughs> So probably not a very good calculation. <laughs> but by updating momentum using force applied to a system at a particular time, and then using that to, to uh, update our position, we can predict the motion of an object arbitrarily into the future. As long as we can keep calculating the force, we can we can keep predicting the motion of objects so this is a very powerful way of doing this uh, okay let's so in fact it's so powerful that there's an interesting aspect of it the current momentum of an object turns out to have the entire history of the object added up into it so everything that ever interacted with the object is added up into the current momentum so if you think about a big a, a tennis racket hitting a ball so at time t0, uh, the ball was at rest. You tossed it up in the air and you hit it just at the moment it was actually at rest. You exert a force, the racket exerts a force this way on the, on the ball and that gives it a certain momentum in that direction. Now at a time, a microsecond later, the tennis racket is still in contact with the ball 
and it's still exerting a force but now as you move the racket the ball has some momentum the force by the impulse by the racket is in that direction so that's going to add to the momentum of now and make it go in a slightly different direction a little bit later different angle the momentum of the ball is being changed by the racket still and then finally when the ball leaves the racket the moment the current moment the momentum of the ball at that instant is now the the sum of all the impulses that the racket exerted on it. All those interactions have been added up and added up and added up into the current momentum. <clears throat> so we now have the entire history of what happened to the ball in its current momentum. Now is the racket still interacting with the ball? Anymore is it? But it doesn't need to because the influence of the racket all got added up into that current momentum to make the ball go the way it's going now. So the entire history of the ball is added up <coughs> into that momentum. This is good because if we had to know all the previous things that happened to an object in order to predict what was going to happen in the future, that would be largely impossible. So it makes, our, it makes possible the, our prediction of motion of objects into the future because their current momentum reflects everything that ever happened to them. So if I roll this ball this way and I bounce it a little better this time and then I move it over here and I put it here and I spin it and whatnot, its current momentum reflects everything that just happened to it. And all we need to know is its current momentum. We don't need to know all the things that happened to it in the past. Okay, so what about directions? <coughs> um, let's think about directions. So here's a basketball that falls straight down, bounces up. Uh, what's the direction of the net impulse applied to the ball by the floor? Direction. Impulse is F force times <coughs> delta T, right? And delta T is positive, so. <coughs> okay. So direction. Okay. So everybody's saying up. <coughs> um, the ball was going down. Now it's going up. <coughs> so. You just did a vector subtraction in your head, right? So, remember that the change in momentum... <laughs> okay. <laughs> change in momentum, let's try to calm it down a little here. <coughs> change in momentum <coughs> is going to be final momentum minus initial momentum, and that's equal to that delta T. So we had initial momentum down, we had final momentum up, and the direction of P final minus P initial is up, right? So we draw from initial to final, that's the direction of delta P, so that's the direction of the impulse. So the direction of the change in momentum has to be the same as the direction of the net impulse. <coughs> okay, this is more interesting. <coughs> An object goes along and then it interacts with something, something exerts an impulse on it. So it was traveling this way, now it's traveling that way. What's the direction of the net impulse that acted on it? I recommend drawing it. B 
actually talking to each other. <coughs> Think with your neighbor. <coughs> Okay. So what's the answer? Uh, four? Okay. How did you get that? You subtracted vectors graphically by get the direction of delta P. So you had P final. We put the vectors tail to tail to subtract them, even if they're not originally. Okay. And then we draw from final to initial, so that's delta P, and we know the direction of delta P is the same as the direction of the net impulse. So that's got to be the direction. You just said draw from final to initial. Well, I meant draw from initial to final, so <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it if you correct mistakes like that because sometimes my brain is on the next thing I want to say and so it's a good thing it's it's not impolite <coughs> all right um, so let's do a calculation <coughs> So we have a baseball. <coughs> whose initial momentum is equal to <coughs> zero zero three kilogram meters per second. <coughs> And it experiences an impulse of uh, negative two, negative two, four Newton seconds. Let's make it negative. Let's make it two negative four. It's more interesting. <coughs> so, what's its final momentum? What's its final momentum? <coughs> Negative two and two and Negative one <coughs> kilogram meters per second. Now there's a problem here because these units are Newton seconds and this unit is kilogram meters per second. So what must a Newton be equal to? So if, if we have Newtons times seconds is kilograms times meters per second, then a Newton must be equal to kilograms times meters over seconds squared. So in our fundamental SI units, that's what a Newton adds up to. 
Suppose I had given you P final and P initial. Could you have calculated the net impulse? Yeah, okay. So not that much to it in these one step things. <coughs> All right. Um, okay, we've done those. So here's, just before it hits a wall, a tennis ball's momentum is zero, zero, negative 1.5 kilogram meters per second. Just after rebounding from the wall, its momentum is zero, zero, 1.5 kilogram meters per second. What was the net impulse applied by the wall? One minute, I want to see everybody answering this one. Talk to your neighbor. Okay, what's the answer? Okay, <coughs> because it was going in the minus x z direction, minus z direction, it hit the wall, it bounced back, the impulse must have been in the plus z direction, and it's okay. All right, you guys are hard to trap here. <coughs> um, Okay, you want to push a book across a table in such a way that its momentum stays constant. The book's already moving. Which statement, which, so which of these statements describes the force you have to exert over one time step? Okay, so what's the answer? Okay, so I see a mixture of answers. So let's, let's go through them and let's refer to, um, let's refer to this when we think about it. So one is, <coughs> You don't need to exert a force at all because the future momentum has to be the same as the momentum now. <coughs> so the future momentum depends on two things, the momentum now and F net delta T. So F net delta T has to be, for, for, the, for the momentum in the future to be exactly the same as the momentum now, F net delta T has to be zero. But is it going to be zero? If I'm 
So if I don't exert a force, what happens? It stops. Why does it stop? It's interacting with the table. Well, friction is not an object. Friction is a, a word used to describe the interaction with the table. But what's the object? The table. So it's interacting with the table. So that's a problem because the net force isn't zero if we don't apply a force because the table is interacting with our system. And so therefore we have to exert a force that just balances out that friction force by the table to get our to slide across it, right? That sounds like, that sounds like two. Why isn't it three? Why don't we have to exert a force that's greater than the friction force applied by the table? It's going to speed up, isn't it? The momentum's going to increase if we do that. So in fact, okay. <coughs> we drop a feather. It falls to the ground at constant speed. <laughs> okay, so it's not a very good feather. <laughs> but... <coughs> During one time step, what's the direction of the net force on the feather? Okay, talk to each other for a minute. Okay, so one, two, three, how many fingers? <coughs> okay, I'm seeing ones, I'm seeing threes, I'm seeing twos. Well, we have some votes for everything. <laughs> okay, so let's go back. To this, to this, to the momentum principle, which says that over a little time interval delta t, the momentum at the end of that time interval depends on two things: the momentum at the beginning and the net impulse acting on it. Now, if it's falling at constant speed, what has to be true about the momentum at the end of the interval and the momentum at the beginning of the interval? They got to be the same, right? <coughs> if there was a net downward impulse, what would happen? It'd speed up, wouldn't it? Yeah. If there was a net upward impulse, what would happen? <laughs> okay. So it turns out that there's a lot of teeth in this this equation here. If the momentum in the future is going to be exactly the same as the momentum now, the net force on our system must be zero during that time interval. Now, how does that work? How can there be a net zero force on a falling object? It's interacting with the Earth, right? Mm -hmm. What else is it interacting with? Is any air. air is touching it, right? So that's a contact interaction. And... <coughs> We know that that force is a very interesting one because it depends on the shape of the object. So if I crumple this up and make it as much like a point particle as I can, it falls very differently than it did when it was had a lot of surface in, in contact with the air. So that's a pretty complicated interaction and yet we're able to deduce 
that that air forced by the air on our falling feather must be exactly equal and opposite to the force by the earth on our falling feather because otherwise it would have been either speeding up or slowing down. <coughs> so there's a lot of deduction that's actually possible here. <coughs> okay, one, one final question. <coughs> I'm not going to kick the basketball, but you can imagine. <laughs> you can imagine kicking the basketball. Okay, so let's Someone have a question? All right, what do you think the answer is? Okay, I'm seeing fours, a lot of fours and a lot of twos. Okay. So how do we decide whether it's px and py or just py? So let's go back to our fundamental equation that says the momentum a short time in the future is equal to the momentum now plus f net delta t. Now this is a vector equation, right? So this is really three, a very compact way of writing three equations. So we would write px px now plus f net x delta t and py in the future is equal to py now plus f net y delta t and p z future p z now f net z delta t so that says that everybody agrees that there's going to be a force in the y direction due to the interaction of the ball with the earth okay so definitely that It looks like that y component of force can't change the x component of momentum. <laughs> Again, we have these three completely independent connect. 
equations here. The, the y component of force is not showing up in this equation. So this is pretty profound. It says that it, a force in the y direction can only affect the component of momentum in the y direction. It can't change the momentum in the x direction. Because since we're assuming that air resistance is negligible, which is a good assumption at low speeds. It's not a good assumption as you get going faster, which you've probably experienced by either skating really fast or riding a bike down a hill or something. You feel the wind in your face the faster you go. <coughs> so that says that we need a force in the x direction to change the x component of momentum. And if we don't have one, it's going to be constant. So in fact, the force by the Earth in the minus y direction can't change the x component of this object's momentum. So there's a lot, a lot of information packed in these very compact equations. So is it two? The answer is indeed two. Okay, okay. this afternoon we're going to practice changing momentum this kind of thing.